what I want to do is start looking at the attributes of NMR data. And so the most prominent attribute is the chemical shift. There's actually many things, many parts of the, um, of, of the NMR spectrum that are worth paying attention to and worth analyzing. But the chemical shift is by far the most um, complicated, telling, all of that stuff. So we're going to spend an entire lecture devoted to it. And then the next lecture, we'll kind of break down the other attributes of the NMR data that are worth paying attention to. So um, the chemical shift we've actually been exposed to already. This is just the, the x-axis value. And we know the units, parts per million, in parts per million um, for a peak in an NMR spectrum. I should take a second as we look into NMR spectrum and start to break down a singular spectrum, um, just to remind ourselves that, or, or kind of inform you all, that um, in spectroscopy, a graph or some other data set that depends on a range of photon frequencies is called a spectrum. Okay, I'm just gonna mention this as sort of an aside. You could think of this as like a book so or like a box within a textbook or something where the author's like oh by the way you should be aware we don't call this the nmr graph or the nmr chart we call it the nmr spectrum and it turns out that if we have a singular in the singular we have spectrum and you can really impress people if you know the the difference between that and the plural it's not spectrums it's spectra so spectra is plural, spectrum is singular. And so that, that covers almost all of spectroscopy. Most of the things, the x-axis is some frequency in some units. Uh, that's true of IR spectroscopy, NMR spectroscopy, UV vis spectroscopy, fluorescent spectroscopy. And so the data chart is actually called a spectrum, singular or spectra, plural. And so sometimes you could say, I've got a spectra of um, I've got a, um, a spectra of spectra, if you want to use the, the, the plural, um, or a spectrum of spectra. I don't know. Okay, anyway, so let's get back to it. Okay, <laughs> the chemical shift. All right, chemical shift again, the x-axis value. The chemical shift is labeled with a lowercase delta. So I'm just emphasizing it here. I probably should have written it in parentheses, but there's the delta. Looks like a music note or something. So that is the kind of label for the chemical shift. The unit is ppm, but if you wanted to say the chemical shift, you'd say delta equals 1.52 ppm for water. Oops, that was terrible. Um, delta for H2O is 1.52 parts per million. Okay, now what this is referring to is, I'm gonna turn the page in a second, this, this chemical shift is referring to how far the x-axis, the, the peak for resonant absorption is shifted based on its chemical environment. So the chemical shift, delta, um, refers to how far a resonant absorption is shifted due to its chemical environment. Now, the important thing to note is that all I'm saying in this long worded, but 
fairly formal definition of chemical shift is that um, the chemical shift is just the x-axis value. We call it delta. It's units are parts per million. Okay, some of these things, you know, we could just make simpler, which makes things a little bit easier. But I wanted to get this formal definition in front of us to remind us that this is all dependent upon the chemical environment. Those peaks are going to spread out away from 300 based on the other things that are around the environment due to the chemical nature of the substance that they're bonded to. Okay. In fact, you could actually draw some general trends. So, oops. And the general trends are, for the most part, um, being closer to electronegative atoms increases the chemical shift. That's a really good point to hold on to. It's one of those like intuition things you just want to keep in mind. If that hydrogen is closer to an electronegative chlorine, it's going to be, um, it's going to have a greater value for the chemical shift. Now, what does that mean? That means more specifically for NMR spectra, electronegative atoms will pull nearby peaks, and I should be careful, I, it's not really pulling anymore, we, we can use the word shift, because that's in the definition of the term that we're using to describe what's happening, we are going to shift nearby peaks, you could think to the left, okay, because the way the NMR spectra work, they all, they being plural, sorry, be done with that. Um, what they do is they start at, to the left, I don't know which, you know, I don't want to screw, screw up the camera here, but on the left side of the spectrum, they're at higher values, and on the right side, they're at lower values. So if you increase the chemical shift, you then go to higher parts per million, which is to the left of, to the left on the x-axis of the NMR spectrum. Okay, now I'm going to leave a blank here. And I'm going to also, and we're going to get to number three here in a second, but then this conversely, um, the converse is true. Electro positive elements shift peaks number one to the right. This is just the opposite. If electronegative shifts things to the left, we're going to go to the right with electropositive elements, which means we're also going to hit lower parts per million values. Now, there's this old, um, old nomenclature that people still use, and I might still accidentally use it, and I'm sorry because it's so counterintuitive, <laughs> but it, it is kind of, um, the lingo is kind of pervasive and it's stuck with all of us chemists. Uh, and it may even stick with you if you do any more formal training in this. But we also say that when you shift to um, the left and higher parts per million, you're shifted down field. <laughs> and to the right, you're shifted up field. Okay, so shifted down field is when you go to the left and shifted up field is when you go to the right. This is terms to help um, reconcile the fact that we're moving um, where the numbers are actually getting lower as you move to the right. So they're saying that as you move to the right along the x-axis, you actually would typically be increasing that x value. So that's up field, whereas left is down field. Okay, now what this really corresponds to um, is back in the day, okay, let me, let me walk you through briefly an NMR spectroscopy experiment now. What we can do is we can actually pulse our system with a, with a huge spectrum of um, radio frequencies. Okay, so all of the radio frequencies are sort of bombarding the um, nucleus at a specific, um, for a specific magnetic field. Okay, so no big deal. It's kind of like what I was describing. 
But it used to be what they would do is they would actually tune the magnetic field strength ever so slightly. And then that would allow, and then what you would do is you would kind of slowly tune. So if you're, if you're, if you're decreasing the magnetic field strength, you would then decrease the alpha to beta state ever so slightly. And you would keep the radio frequency constant. So what they would do is they would sort of turn down the magnetic field until they saw resonant absorption and then just scan across the magnetic field to see when the frequency of absorption would occur, okay? So by doing that, you could, um, uh, you could start to pick up on resonant absorption events, um, but it was due to changing the field, not the uh, uh, frequency. You still get the same values because the parts per million stuff would work out. But anyway, I'm not gonna write anything more down about that. I'm just going to write shifted downfield, shifted upfield. I'm gonna put a sorry next to this. Okay, and that's just um, <laughs> me being a resonant of the upper Midwest and um, apologizing <laughs> for using the terminology correctly, but using old terminology that you're not responsible for. So this is me just writing this in your notes so that um, when you hear me say, as we're going through NMR together in the future, uh, and we're talking about in particular certain peaks in the NMR spectrum, I might say, oh, I wonder why that got shifted downfield. And you're like, what is that? And that's just me saying shifted to the left. Okay, anyway, let's turn the page, move on from that. So what we want to do is um, think about why these things happen. Why an electronegative element will pull things or shift things to the left, an electropositive element will shift things to the right. So it turns out that there are, um, this is all due to the electrons within the bonds that are attaching our atom to the rest of the molecule. So what we can do is think about the influence of electrons on the chemical shift. Okay, this is going to get into an idea called nuclear shielding. Okay, so nuclear shielding. What we do is, is we first recognize that electrons control the in chemical environment felt by an atom. I mean, for the most part, chemistry is all about just kind of moving electrons around to reveal new attachment opportunities for the nuclei in atoms. So let's make note of that. Electrons control the chemical environment felt by an atom. Okay, so why is that? Well, an electron, if we think about it, it's, it's better to think about it as sort of a cloud or a density, but it does have some particle properties to it. And if it's a particle, then it's spinning and it's charged and things that are spinning and charged as we talked about create or emit magnetic fields. If it spins, it then emits a magnetic field. And then what we have is we have our electron with its Dumbo ears, there's its magnetic field lines. Now the important thing to not forget is that even though the cloud can be of low density and thereby I suppose take up a larger volume, this is a pretty low mass charged particle. So this is still going to be much smaller than protons in a nucleus. Much smaller or less massive It's a bit awkward. So it's just important to know it's really small. It's a tiny bar magnet. If it's a bar magnet, if you wanna think about it as a bar magnet at all, it's a really tiny bar magnet. So the tiny magnetic field emitted by an 
electron actually shields. It actually shields our atom of interest from H0. Hmm. That's kind of um, an interesting point. Where does that come from? And what do I mean by shielding? Well, um, what's sort of happening here is if we have our big bar magnet, that's a proton, okay? and it's feeling the effects of H zero. Okay, the tiny bar magnets nearby, the tiny bar magnets nearby will actually work on the outside to sort of move down. I'm gonna change the color on this to make it more clear at least on the arrowheads. What actually happens here is that the magnetic field, the way it sort of is emitted, so those arrowheads are upside down. Goodness, I'm screwing this up. Okay, arrowheads down, arrowheads down, arrowheads down. The way that the magnetic field lines sort of emit their magnetic field is we're going to see on the outside of the electron, which is where the proton is, a sort of canceling effect from H0 and H0 and the electrons. So let's put it this way. The magnetic field from the electron cancels some, and by some, I mean a very small amount, some of the, some of the big magnetic field from H0. So the electron, that tiny bar magnet, is emitting its, its magnetic field the way that magnetic fields get emitted from spinning particles, okay? But because it goes up and then down, it's going to actually cancel with H0. And so what this means is this means that our bigger bar magnet from the proton feels less of H0. So as a result, of the canceling effect, which I can't emphasize enough is small. As a result of this canceling effect, which is small, the 1H atom, now let's put it as a proton. The proton in the nucleus will feel less of H0. maybe feels kind of a weird word. How about experience less of H0? Now, if you have less of H0, what does that do to everything else? Well, the first thing is it's going to reduce this, the uh, energy required to flip to the beta state. Okay, reduces the energy required to flip to the beta state. That will then reduce the photon frequency because the frequency has to correspond with an energy. Frequency 
multiply that by Planck's constant, h nu, to get to the energy, that frequency of that photon has to be less because it has to perfectly match the energy gap. If it's still high, if it's too high because the energy gap shrunk, not because the photon changed, but if the energy gap changes, then the photon is too big, it's not gonna absorb. A smaller photon has to come in and absorb, a smaller frequency photon, a lower energy photon. So that's gonna reduce the photon energy. And if we reduce the photon energy and the photon frequency, what does that do to parts per million? We'll recall parts per million. Okay, yeah, you've got this complicated math, but the parts per million is always directly, directly correlates with the frequency. So if you decrease the frequency, you then decrease the parts per million value of delta. Remember, delta is the chemical shift. Now the reduced parts per million value could be quite large, okay? Now, how do we do this again? How do we do this? We have to let an electron shield our proton of interest. So how does this occur? Well, let's recall that electropositive elements do not take electron density. In fact, they sort of donate it, but we haven't talked a lot about electropositive elements, but let's think about one, for example. So don't, do not take electron density. Now an example would be of an electropositive element. Well, let's think for a second while I turn the page. How do we decrease electronegativity? So electropositivity is the opposite of electronegativity. So when I say, let's do, let's pick an element that's more electropositive, we're gonna do the opposite of what we would do with electronegativity. We move up into the right in the periodic table to get to something that's more electronegative, stopping at fluorine and then can't really use the noble elements. So fluorine is the most electronegative. So then just move in the opposite direction, left and down to get to more electropositive elements. So here's an example. Example of an electropositive element would be silicon. Go ahead and write it. Silicon. Okay, so silicon is actually quite electropositive. And what that means is that we have more electrons, and I'm going to write electron density around the 1H atoms in, let's think of a silicon compound that we can use as an example. So I'm seeing silicon's more electropositive, but we wanna study a 1H NMR spectrum. We can't then look at, we have to look at hydrogen, not silicon. Well, a compound that we know a lot about in terms of its NMR properties that we were just introduced to was TMS, tetramethylsilane. So the hydrogen is attached to carbon, which is attached to silicon. And we have the rest of the molecule in various places. Okay. So this is electropositive. And the influence of that electropositive element is going to be felt all the way through two bonds to that hydrogen atom. So it's feeling more electrons, okay, that is. So it feels the influence, and by it, let me highlight that, that is this hydrogen atom. Feels a greater um, amount of electron density. Now it hasn't like actually gained electrons. It hasn't been reduced as we would say, but rather if you think about what electronegative atoms do, they pull electron density towards themselves, distort the molecular orbital, and make the bond more polar, right? So we put a delta positive on one atom and delta negative on the other. Here, we kind of flip that around, not as much as some of the more pronounced electronegative atoms, but the effect is very similar. The cloud around that hydrogen is a little bit bigger. 
we feel greater density of those electrons. And what do electrons do? They provide little tiny bar magnets to shield the hydrogen atoms within um, and the protons within that nucleus of the hydrogen atom. They shield them a bit so that they don't experience as much as H0. So we um, shield the 1H atoms. Now going through the series of events I just mentioned, that's going to decrease the PPM value of the chemical shift. And we actually define that to be zero, but I said a key advantage of TMS was that the peaks were far away, far removed from all of the other atoms, um, all of the other kind of things in our sample. Remember TMS is a reference standard. Well, the reason why is the silicon. The silicon pulls everything to, I won't go right or left on the, on the camera. It will pull everything to the right closer to zero. I mean, right on zero. It'll pull everything further to the right, which we've defined as zero, making it so that everything else can show up to the left between you know one and 14. So everything's kind of a positive number for the most part. It can be negative. It can be more shielded than silicon, but for the most part, it's not for the most part these values are positive. Now, what do electronegative atoms do? Okay, well, they pull the electron density towards themselves. Sometimes we say they are electron withdrawing. They tug the electrons towards themselves. They get a, not a full-blown negative charge. They're not reduced, but they get a delta minus, a partial negative charge, okay? Leaving behind a partial positive charge. They pull electron density towards themselves. That means that the 1H atoms, even a few bonds removed, the 1H atoms and C13 atoms um, are, in effect, deshielded. What does that mean to be deshielded? Well, you don't have the electrons, the tiny bar magnets to protect you from H0. You've experienced the full brunt or a fuller brunt, excuse me, of that big external magnetic field. You're deshielded. And if you're deshielded, you experience more H0. If you experience more H0, the alpha to beta gap is larger. The alpha beta gap is larger. The frequency of absorption is larger. If the frequency of absorption is larger, the PPM value is larger. Um, that is to say, if you keep a constant magnetic field, then you, you can actually, um, if you keep a constant frequency, you have to decrease the magnetic field slightly. Okay, so uh, <laughs> didn't need to throw that in there. To the right, we move to the right in the NMR spectrum. Okay, so that's what electronegative atoms do. They do what we talked about that they do a lot in organic chemistry one, that is they distort bonds, they pull electron density towards themselves. Now, the poor hydrogens and carbons are left with less electron density to protect or shield them against the external magnetic field. And what you get is a greater um, effect. Now let's go through some examples of some ranges. I know we've been talking already for a bit, but let's kind of, as we've talked through this, let's look at some typical ranges. So if you have an alkyl group, H attached to C, where C is part of an alkyl chain, this will show up between about 0 0.8 and 2.0 parts per million, okay? And so that would be this 0 0.8 to 2.0 parts per million corresponds to the hydrogen that's attached to a carbon, that's attached to another carbon. Now, what you can do is you can introduce some electronegative groups with varying degrees of electronegativity in varying distance from the hydrogen atom to look at how things impact, how these impact the chemical shift. Well, if we look at this another, a different example, we've introduced a carbon oxygen double bond. The oxygen is highly electronegative. Just by putting that within the proximity, 
of that hydrogen that we looked at previously. You change the chemical environment of the starred hydrogen sufficiently so that we shift the chemical shift to the left, downfield we would say, at about 2.0 to 2.5 parts per million. Notice, you know, we haven't changed the element. We haven't really changed the atom it's connected to. We've changed an atom nearby. That's why the term chemical environment is so helpful. It's not the chemistry, which is the transformations it can undergo. It's not the chemical properties. It's the environment due to the electrons from the neighboring atoms. Okay. Now, if you bring that oxygen one atom closer, you further take that hydrogen's chemical shift to the left because the electronegative atom has become closer. That hydrogen is even less shielded than it was before because it's experiencing fewer of the atoms. Now, we start to see some interesting properties of other types of bonds. When we introduce double bonds, we see that the chemical shift changes from 4.0 to 6.0 parts per million. So I'm increasing the chemical shift. I'm moving further to the left, okay, to greater and greater energies or frequencies required for absorption. This tells us something really interesting about the electronic properties of a carbon-carbon double bond, suggesting that the carbon-carbon double bond is as electron withdrawing as like a halogen. So if you go HCx, where x equals fluorine, chlorine, bromine, we're going to again see that really between 3.5 to 6.0 parts per million. So just having a carbon-carbon double bond, we see a similar effect as though the hydrogen were directly attached to an, a, an X. If we have a benzene ring present, okay, again, we don't really have an electronegative atom present. We further shift our chemical shift out to 7.0 to 8.0 parts per million. And in fact, during lab, I'm going to emphasize that if you see anything between seven and eight, it tells you right away that you have a benzene, which a lot of the examples we provided have benzenes because they make for interesting spectra. And then lastly, if you move that, oh, let, me, let me draw it as kind of a Kekulé not notation. If you move the, I kind of screwed it up again. If you move the carbon oxygen double bond right next to the hydrogen of interest, this is an aldehyde, I'm going to make sure I star my hydrogen in every case for the notes. The aldehyde hydrogen, we're going to see now at 10 to 11 parts per million. So the closer that electronegative atom gets, the more deshielded the hydrogen gets, and the more to the left or greater the parts per million value becomes. And we can see something different in carbon-13 NMR, or excuse me, something very similar in carbon-13 NMR where if we have our C13 NMR spectrum, we once again have delta. It's just now the chemical shift ranges much greater. Let's go 300 to zero at about 240 to 200. We see the carbon oxygen double bond at about 170 to 100, we'll see the carbon-carbon double bond and then 80 to 50, we see a carbon-oxygen single bond. I'm gonna get rid of this line here, or this line there. And then the carbon-carbon single bond comes in at a much lower chemical shift, closer to zero. So those are the chemical shift ranges for carbon directly attached to oxygen with varying amounts of uh, car oxygen and carbon, varying amounts of um, bond numbers. And so this just goes to emphasize that fact that the closer you are to electronegative atoms or electronegative functional groups, the more deshielded you are and the further to the left in the NMR spectrum that you'll be. Now, it's important to emphasize that I've talked about a hydrogen being attached to carbon. So we'll only worry about 
H star attached to C. Maybe we might do a little bit with carbon 13. So maybe I'll qualify this for 1H NMR. Okay, if you look in every example I showed previously, I had the hydrogen atom directly attached to a carbon. Well, what about HX, HO, or HN? Surely these would be fascinating and shifted further to the left to emphasize the electronegativity effect. That is indeed the case, but it's a little bit more complicated to analyze. It turns out that everything I have drawn here is what we would call an acidic hydrogen. It's a hydrogen directly attached to an electronegative element and is readily, readily kind of undergoes an acid-base equilibrium. And it turns out these actually wash away during the NMR experiment. So don't worry about these. Okay, so we won't worry about what the chemical shift, shift is of HCl. It's easy to get the structure of HCl from its molecular formula, H and Cl. Okay, so with that, it's a pretty long one. We'll go ahead and end that there. Um, we'll be able to start to dissect the other attributes of NMR spectroscopy in upcoming lectures.